Uh, good morning from Tennessee and uh, Kentucky. Um, I'm live streaming right now with Nathan Salzberg. He's the Alan Lomax archivist at the Association for Cultural Equity, which is based on the East Coast, but he's based out of our neighboring state in Kentucky. He's also a, a fantastic musician who just keeps dropping uh, new albums, but he's agreed to speak to me and via me to my students and to the people who listen to the teacher on the radio at 88.5 FM WTTU from the campus of Tennessee Tech in Cookville, Tennessee, um, about the, the legacy, the lineage, and the importance of Alan Lomax. So let's do the um, classroom level introduction to the, to the new kids. Who is Alan Lomax to you and why should we study him, care about him, and how does he help us sort of get into this idea of Americana. And even for me, um, as I'm communicating uh, it with my students, the idea of collecting and the idea of a mixtape, the idea of um, putting together uh, these stories uh, that aren't that long ago, but without people like you and people like Alan Lomax might be lost uh, to us as we, as we swim in the algorithm. So welcome, uh, Nathan Salzberg. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, it's perhaps the easiest way to think about Alan Lomax and his influence and legacy uh, to describe him as perhaps the foremost folklorist of the 20th century, which might not mean that much. But when you think about the depth and breadth of his work, he uh, began making recordings at the age of 18 in 1933 with his father, John A. Lomax. And Alan worked his way through the 20th century uh, up to 1991 where his last recordings, he saw um, communities change indelibly all over the world throughout the American South, the British Isles, Italy, Spain, saw the effects of um, industrialization, modernization, um, mass media over radio and television. He saw the way that these you know, mass entertainment industries change local culture. And he was on hand to document uh, uh, so much of it, starting with the disc recording machine in the 1930s and then moving to mono tape in the late 40s, stereo tape in the 1950s and 60s, and then film and video come the 1970s and 80s and 90s. Um, and we know him primarily because of the people that he, the most famous people that he and or his father recorded, Lead Belly, Muddy Waters, Woody Guthrie, Bessie Jones, Aunt Molly Jackson. But he recorded absolutely hundreds and hundreds of people whose names would quite likely otherwise be lost to us and to history. Um, recorded their songs, their dances, their stories, their jokes, uh, their reminiscences about their lives and the places they were from. And his commitment was to something he called cultural equity. The idea that Every culture, every individual has the right to have their particular expressive tradition, whether that expresses itself in music, in recipes, in dress, um, whatever the local culture might be, that everyone deserves the right to have those traditions, not just respected, but to be uh, advocated for and supported in the face of these you know, mass media conglomerates that were really quite, you know, stamping out local culture uh, for much of the 20th century and continue to do so today in the digital realm. Um, okay, how did you, uh, this is Andrew Smith, I had muted myself, so there was an even longer silence. How did you, Nathan Salzberg, find your way uh, to uh, Alan Lomax and how does it uh, connect with your um, 21st century and uh, late 20th century first music fandom, but also your uh, role as a, a creator of independent music. I mean, it seems to me that in some weird way, problematic though uh, streaming services may be, that the internet has has re-democratized uh, DIY and uh, and the culture and the internet have re-democratized uh, music and 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 do you feel like people are maybe finding their way to your website uh, uh, to to this rabbit hole, if you will? I feel like whenever I, I uh, listened uh, to your podcast interviews previously, or have gone on the YouTube channel for the Lomax Archive, or listened to your podcast with everything from like 
you know, obscure political songs to weird uh, holiday celebrations uh, that, that he was able to uncover when he was in the United Kingdom. Um, like, how did you get there? And how do you feel like that other musicians and other people in today's DIY culture are are beneficiaries of um, of, of Alan? I mean, as I as I told you in the email, Nathan, I found out about you reading uh, Amanda Petrusis's book and she described you guys dumpster diving for 78s. I mean, that's like a passion and uh, kind of a, just a great story. So maybe tell a, a little bit of some stories about how you found your way to the work that you do regarding the um, archive and maybe how that connects with your work as an independent uh, DIY musician in this 21st uh, digital century. Well, okay, that's a lot. I'll see if I can hit all the points. Um, I grew up with a compilation of 78s, um, reissues of 78s recorded between 1927 and 1937. And I was familiar with bluegrass, but I had never heard real old time music as it was recorded in the 1920s. And all of its immediacy, its power, its you know fury, uh, was became immediately obvious to me. And obvious, you know, its connection, at least aesthetically, energetically, to punk rock was was very clear. Um, and I really just sort of went down that rabbit hole. Um, you getting a copy from my father of the anthology of American folk music compiled by Harry Smith in 1952. Um, John Cohen's recordings of Roscoe Holcomb um, and on and on. The Georgia Sea Island Singers is recorded by Alan Lomax. Um, I moved to New York City in the year 2000 after I graduated and uh, from college and really just it's a long story, but just found my way by the grace of God, really landed a job just basically as an administrative assistant at the Lomax Archive in New York, the Association for Cultural Equity, as you said, is the official name of our organization. And as you know, it's been 22 and a half years now, I've just sort of stuck around. So my learning was on the ground. It was not through any kind of technical or academic bona fides. Um, and it was through listening, you know, just listening and reading. For a while, I thought I wanted to go and do an ethnomusicolo ethnomusicology program, you know, an MA or PhD. PhD, perhaps in folklore, but I've been able to learn everything, not everything, but been it, what I've wanted to learn, I've been able to learn through my position at the Lomax Archive and just through listening, digging, discovering. Um, and, you know, Lomax himself was, he didn't realize the extent to which the American folk tradition had been documented on, on 78 RPM records until he came into a handful of them in 1940. He'd been making recordings for seven years, discovered a handful of uh, 20s, 78s on labels like Paramount, Jeanette, Victor, uh, discovered some of the just incredible artists like Wilmer Watts and his Lonely Eagles, um, Furry Lewis, just in a junk shop in New York and realized that there was this incredible mass of site-specific musical traditions that these commercial labels had recorded purely because they wanted to sell gramophones. They wanted to sell phonograph machines. Uh, they wanted to sell the furniture the phonograph machines came in. So the records were really an afterthought, but they managed to do this incredible documentation of these regional traditions. And traditions, like I said earlier, that were really dying out come the 1940s. You know, radio, um, Hollywood, uh, the LP record come the 1950s. You know, this music was people started to want to sound like Gene Autry or they wanted to sound like the cowboys in the movies. They weren't interested. Some people were, but a lot of people, you know, they wanted to make money off their music. So they tried to ape what they saw, you know, on the movie reels and what they saw heard coming across the radio. So to me, my interest in just sort of, you know, what people might call traditional music, vernacular music, they call it down home music is really based in. I hesitate to use this word because it's a fraught one, 
but how much something authentically represents the people and the place from whence it comes. I mean, authenticity is a really, can be a really ugly word when used to describe sort of, you know, uh, uh, cultural expressions, but we kind of know when we hear it, right? We know when something is real, we know when something's putting us on. And the recordings that Lomax made, you know, he was a producer and he made choices about what he recorded. He there's always going to be some kind of middleman unless we're out there doing the recordings ourselves. There's always going to be some kind of curatorial function. But Lomax was, you know, he did incredible work documenting in the best possible technology available to him um, these musicians and their traditions all over the world. So some people ask, you know, if Lomax died in 2002, and in fact, today is his birthday. He was born in 1915 on January 31st. But some people ask, you know, if Lomax were around today, what would he be recording? And I think the answer is that he would not be making recordings because as you say, YouTube and everything else provides a platform for people to do TikTok, you know, Instagram, their own documentation. And some people get lucky and some people get heard. Uh, in a lot of cases, they don't because we still are playing against a system that's tilted towards the big producers, the big investors, the big culture industries, uh, and streaming services obviously make music available to us, but at the cost of musicians' livelihoods. So there's still a lot that can be done in terms of leveling the playing field and uh, you know, in the pursuit of the idea of cultural equity. But you know, things are certainly more democratic in terms of transmitters versus receivers as they used to be. Uh, my mind is so blown because uh, you live in Kentucky and this today is Thomas Merton's birthday. And he was also born on January 31st, 1915. There should be like a, a, a Thomas Merton, Alan Lomax festival. <laughs> uh, Tyler Childers on his new record uses a lot of weird archival recordings and he includes an archival recording of Thomas Merton speaking embedded on one of uh, the third album, The Weird Experiment. He put out three versions of the same album uh, just uh, last year. Um, Nathan, can you speak to me? Because I think the students and I really care about this today. And we, we seem to be, uh, history seems to be repeating itself because we haven't learned our learned our lessons. Um, wasn't Alan Lomax really almost uh, kind of, could you say, educated or politicized by his music gathering to become kind of a... Uh, a, a, a social justice uh, uh, consciousness raiser for the entire society around the Great Depression, around the labor movement, through his work with uh, uh, Woody Guthrie, uh, through his uh, understanding of maybe the problematic side of what he did going into the churches and the prisons and the in the black community in the in the Deep South at, during segregation as a as a white person, you know, and and kind of the tension of bringing someone like Lead Billy, you know, to the big city. Could you speak just a little bit to his his commitments to um, causes that today are all of the forefront, uh, especially in places like where you and I live in Kentucky and Tennessee, we are, we are fighting so many civil rights battles right now, just like, you know, right today uh, there, there's probably things being discussed in, in Kentucky state house as is in, um, in Tennessee that are, are problematic for progressive or liberationist uh, type folk. So how did Alan kind of situate himself uh, as a cultural person who also had these, um, these commitments to uh, to to fairness, justice, and kind of the the better the better nature of America. It's a great question, and he was the extent of his commitment. I think is is um, inseparable from his commitment to his his political commitments were one and the same uh, with his commitment to his work, his documentary his documentary work, and his. Uh, you know, promotion work. I say that word, it's kind of an ugly word, but it, you know, in addition, his idea wasn't just to do the documentation and put tapes on archive shelves. He was fundamentally interested in including the voices that he recorded in whatever media was available to him and to them. So again, you know, he, he used radio, he used the LP record. He later, you know, got into making films and TV for PBS. Um, he had a profound impact in the British Isles over BBC radio, you know, England, but also Ireland over um, uh, I, uh, uh, what now is, what was it called? The Irish broadcaster, RTE. Um, 
you know, really carving out space in the midst of these, again, like dominant media formats to sort of slip in voices of working class people. What he would have said at the time were the voices of the voiceless. And some of this kind of heroic language might rub us the wrong way now. But, you know, he was in a position of privilege, certainly. In 1933, he and his father could walk into a Southern penitentiary, ask the warden to set up recording the black inmates uh, and make recordings that, um, you know, were some of the most powerful documents of really human ingenuity and creativity in the face of like a profound brutality. Um, and Alan continued to make recordings of the black pen and the black work songs in the Southern penitentiary system from 33 to 1959. Uh, and his access, of course, he realized the extent of his access. Uh, if he were a black man, he could never could have done that sort of work. Um, the, there's a difference to be sketched out between he and his father. His father was a classic Texas, well, Mississippi born, but Texas bred, um, you know, Southern, fairly patrician gentleman. You know, he was from a working class background, but, uh, you know, worked at a bank before the depression. And he had a sense, you know, he was a white supremacist. He didn't wear a KKK gown, but, you know, he was like anyone else nearly everyone else, a white man born in 1864, um, 1867 rather, uh, you know, he believed in the supremacy of the white race and he cared deeply about black cultural forms, but saw them, you know, in sort of the context of the Jim Crow South, saw his work as sort of defending what he saw to be, you know, the old um, preferable, balance uh in the south before you know say before the civil war before, you know certainly before um uh, uh um reconstruction um and he was i can't I, I was going to quote him but there are words that i don't want to use on the radio so let it be said that alan lomax was diametrically opposed to his father politically and in 1932 alan was at harvard he went to harvard for one year and he was hip to what was going on in the coal fields in Harlan County, Kentucky, what they called, you know, what they called Bloody Harlan. And the labor strikes there as um, the, you know, what was then called the uh, National Miners Union was attempting to unionize the coal fields and failed ultimately. But that really radicalized Allen. And from there on, he saw the work that he did is fundamentally about preserving, you know, pr preserving, but also carving out this space for people to express um, their, both their, you know, their needs and their joys and also their sorrows. Um, and there's a story that was told. And unfortunately, the recording that refers to man stood up and, um, said, you know, he came up to the to the microphone to sing a song that uh, he had made up, he said. And it began by him looking into the recording microphone and saying, hello, Mr. President. And the Lomaxes waited for him to sing his song. And there was this pregnant pause. And John said, are you going to sing? And the man said, oh, I was waiting for the president to hello me back. And Alan was totally struck by this experience, you know, th thinking of that it's, this should be a two-way communication system, and it's not. It's a one-way communication system. And this man went on to sing a song called We Poor Farmers, and basically asking the president to come down to Huntsville, Texas, and do what he could for these poor black sharecroppers in 1933. So all of this fed into Lomax's, you know, both, you know, again, political and sort of documentary commitments. Um, and he actually had to leave America in 1950 under the auspices or under the, the pretense of going to England and working on a what became the first LP series of what we might call world music now, something called the Columbia World Library of Folk and Primitive Music for Columbia Records. But he had to get out of the country because his friends Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie were blacklisted and his politics were much the same. So he left for most of the 50s, coming back in 1958 to a much changed America. I feel like because of the uh, the glamour of the kind of the folk scene after Dylan um, and the hippie scene, you know, after 
I don't know, the Beatles or the Grateful Dead and the and the and the civil rights movement after Martin Luther King Jr., that we often forget how incredibly radical and radicalizing the 1930s were and how much you know, people like Lomax um, participated. And I mean, I, I just think, uh, I hope you've read John, John Zved. I, I don't know how to say his last name. If you read the biography uh, about Lomax, it's got so, so many incredible stories in there of, of just, you know, you know, the, the movement of, of, of folk music intersecting with uh, labor organizing and social justice. And it just kind of, you know, blossomed. So, we kind of danced in my first question, uh, Nathan, we kind of danced around what I'm, what I'm hoping to have as a little bit of a takeaway. And I, you, you might not be able to, you know, convince anybody that here's this that's in my class at Tennessee Tech this semester to, to dig further. But I'd be curious, you know, how is this so important to us today? And maybe there's some reference of uh, in contemporary music um that we can that we can talk about that are happening right now i mean i immediately think of smithsonian and the uh rhiannon giddens uh super group of uh women of color uh reviving um, our understanding of how you know the banjo came from africa uh, for example but maybe you could talk at least just a little bit about um what's happening in independent folk music today that that seems to be quite uh, faithful to what Alan Lomax and Harry Smith started for us back in the, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So, so can you just talk a little bit about the contemporary folk scene, and then we'll start to move uh, uh, toward our, our, our conclusion of this brief interview, and I thank you so much for your time. Sure. Well, I should say that I don't really know much about the contemporary folk scene, so I'm probably not the guy to speak intelligently about this, but I will say that um, you know, folk revivals have happened in this country um, on and off for many years now. And I think that whenever there is a particularly fraught political moment in this country, um, thoughtful, creative people, um, some thoughtful, creative people dig back into history and... Um, certainly expressions of other historical moments for a sense of continuity, a sense of, uh, you know, guidance, a sense of direction, um, and to learn how people, how our forebears made it through, you know, difficult times and much more difficult times in a lot of ways than we, um, and certainly white guys like us are living through. Um, and the through line, you know, Lomax saw this in the 1930s, you know, the through line of American folk music. Well, I should say this. When John Lomax, um, John Lomax was first interested in cowboy songs in the 19 teens. He went to Harvard and showed a professor of his a collection of cowboy songs that he'd collected since he was a young man. And he was told they were vulgar trash. And he was so embarrassed that he went home and he burned his collection. And, uh, and this was earlier. I'm sorry, not the teens. This was in what? Around 1900. Ten years later, he had found another professor who was much more sympathetic to the idea of there being a, a Native American folk tradition, by which I don't mean, you know, indigenous, but uh, uh, um, a folk tradition that is native to this country that doesn't it isn't just echoes of the British Isles, which is what folklore amounted to around the turn of the century. And even for someone like John Lomax, you know, he was obviously for all of his conservative political orientation, he was looking like we were all like we're all looking for some sense of what it is to be an American in particularly trying times. And he found that the cowboy songs and later the American folk songs in general, black and white and indigenous and Mexican, um, give us a sense of who we are. And so anyone who is interested in going back to the archive writ large, not just the Lomax archive, but the historical archive, can find all of these voices, many of them competing, some of them uh, distasteful to us, but they give us a sense of the diversity and the complexity of our history. They quite frankly, what we get from mainstream culture, mainstream educational standards, don't give us, doesn't give us. So I think the idea that now we're seeing such a concerted, dedicated effort to unearth and uh, reconstruct, re-translate uh, some of these songs into our contemporary moment, 
is uh, you know an expression of a real vital need that we that we are so much of us are experiencing as Americans in 2023, um, and you see that in both what's called folk music and also in all kinds of other you know Beyonce is licensing uh, licensed a couple Lomax recordings for songs on her Lemonade record. I mean these voices have resonance far beyond their original contexts, far beyond their original emplacements. And every time they're reused, you know, this sort of constellation is formed between the past and present that I think is really valuable uh, and really powerful. What is, uh, to find, last question, let's make this the last question. I'll keep it to the 30 minutes we agreed on. What was the coolest surprise as far as maybe meeting somebody or getting to uh, uh, learn something new or even travel somewhere? Just just draw on your 20, you said over 20 years doing this work, something just surprising or delightful or hilarious, just something cool that you got to do um, being an archivist at the Alan Lomax archive that, that you never would have gotten to do had you not followed this path. And I know it intersects with your music career and we haven't talked about that. So we, you can save that for the next guy that sends you a, a cold email asking for your help. So we'll keep this to, to the Lomax uh, work that you do. What's the just the most interesting and unconventionally cool thing that's happened in these 20 plus years of your work? I'm sure that there, I could come up with something maybe better than this, but um, just off the cuff, something that comes to mind is um, in 2011 or 12, I can't remember, I was invited to go to Moscow to speak to a consortium of independent Russian radio producers. Um, it was through the invitation of an American who apparently is still there, who's been involved in, um, you know, independent radio production in Moscow. And no one, no one there, actually there was one person who came who had heard the name Alan Lomax. And I gave some remarks and they were translated. So everything that I had prepared, you know, it took twice as long to say what I wanted to say because it was in translation. I ended up cutting things way back. It was a very basic introduction to him. I played some music, um, but I heard from all of these people afterwards who came from all over Russia to be a part of this conference, how valuable it is to know that there is, you know, there are these models of, uh, cultural docu documentarians who go out into rural areas, do the work of meeting people, of you know, befriending people, familiarizing their self, themselves with these places, their conditions. You know, don't just drop in, make some recordings and leave, but really make these connections with communities, come back again and again. Um, there are certainly Russian um, uh, uh, um there are plenty of Russians who have done this work as well. I mean, there's a huge, there was a huge, um, several huge folklore archives in Russia. But I think about those journalists a lot. Some of them who came from, you know, fairly from Siberia, from, uh, you know, from fairly remote places across Russia. I think about them now, uh, certainly when I'm sure all of their radio stations are off the air, their outlets have been shut down. And I wonder, um, I hope that some of what we talked about that day is ringing just a little bit in their ears. Not that they needed to hear from me, but just to know that I could introduce Lomax as like another model of someone who was out trying to do the crucial work of collecting the voices of people not in power, people who have less agency, certainly in a political system like contemporary Russia's. Um, just wonder if that connection, if that connection ever bore fruit in any meaningful way, because it was really powerful to me because those people, even then 10 years ago, were doing really difficult work uh, in Putin's Russia. And now I'm sure it's just become exponentially more so if they can do it at all. Um, so I hope to think that we made some connection then that's that's served, you know, some some purpose, some constructive purpose 10 years on in this particularly horrible moment in you know Russia's history. Um, I'm Andrew Smith, teacher on the radio at Tennessee Tech University. My guest for this uh, half hour live stream with uh, slow internet on his end uh, has been Nathan Salzberg, uh, who lives in Kentucky, but is uh, remotely works for the Association of Cultural Equity, the Alan Lomax Archive. Um, it's been an honor and a joy to share this half hour with you. And I hope that at least one person, maybe like the, uh, those folks you met in Moscow, will have heard this and maybe take a deeper look 
at the um, old folk music tradition, the uh, folklore tradition in, in the United States, especially early uh, 20th century, as we are now in the in the 20s of the 21st century, we'll go back 100 years and learn about these uh, these great folks like Alan Lomax. Nathan, thank you so much for giving me of your time so generously. And um, I appreciate you and I wish you um, a great day. Thank you. And you. Thanks a lot.